Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is David Robinson. I'm part of the senior leadership team here at Geoscience Australia, and it is my pleasure today to convene today's seminar. I'll begin with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the lands on which this uh, seminar is being hosted today. Pay my respects in particular to the elders past and present. I'd like to also extend those respects to uh, the traditional owners of the lands from which uh, Geoscience Australia works on across the, the country, the lands and the sea, and also extend that to the lands from which many of you online will be joining us both uh, within Australia and also overseas. Today we have a double bill. We have two presenters. Each will present a 20 minute presentation and we'll go through both presentations and then come back at the end with a Q&A for both of the presenters. So the first talk this morning will be presented by Ladina Carr. The title for this talk is Increasing the Prospectivity of Northern Australia. Impacts from the recent Exploring for the Future Seismic Acquisition and Regional Geology Studies in the South Nicholson region in the Northern Territory. The work was undertaken in collaboration with the Northern Territory Geological Survey and the Queensland Geological Survey, uh, OSCO and the MINEX CRC. And the new data that will be presented today helps to link the highly prospective resource rich areas of the MacArthur Basin and the Mount Isa province via a continuous seismic traverse across central northern Australia. The second talk is titled Towards a Regional Understanding of Sherbrook Super Sequence Gross Depositional Environments in the Offshore Otway Basin and will be presented by Steve Abbott. The Sherbrooke super sequence is the youngest of four Cretaceous super sequences in the Otway Basin and was deposited during a phase of crustal extension. This presentation shows how a basin scale gross depositional environment map for the Sherbrooke super sequence was constructed. It will talk about the significance of the map for the Austral 3 petroleum system and why this type of GDE mapping is important for pre-competitive basin studies at Geoscience Australia. I'll introduce both speakers and then they'll interchange um, directly with one another. So our first speaker, Ladina Carr, is a geoscientist in the Onshore Energy Systems Directorate within the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia. She graduated from the Australian National University, major in, in geology and anthropology with an honours degree. In 2007, she joined Geoscience Australia with what was then the ACRES team, focusing on satellite imagery. And in 2009, she moved to the Onshore Energy and Mineral Division to work as a seismic interpreter and basin analysis, the style of work that she'll be talking about today. She also has a Diploma of Project Management and is currently the module leader for the Onshore Basin Inventory Project in the Exploring for the Future program. Steve Abbott joined Geoscience Australia in 2013, where he works as a basin analyst on stratigraphic studies of Australia's offshore sedimentary basins. Past roles include mineral exploration, made mainly sedimentary uranium in Central Australia, teaching and research at Southern Cross University, James Cook University and the University of Tasmania, and regional mapping with the Northern Territory Geological Survey. Steve is a graduate from Flinders University with honours and James Cook University where he has a PhD. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Ladina to the stage to begin the presentation. David, thanks for that uh, great introduction and uh, welcome to country. Um, I'd like to just uh, start this presentation, like take off my glasses because I can't see the room and the slides, uh, by acknowledging all my co-authors. There are a lot, 
uh, we're quite a big team and we work uh, widely across the agency. So it's not everyone, but it's the main part of the team. We also work with the NTGS um, and the MinEx CRC. So they're our main collaborators on this project. So this is the plan for the talk. Um, we're going to go through um, just what the EFTF program is and also some background geology. And then I'm going to discuss four components of our studies in Northern Australia. These include, of course, the South Nicholson Survey, Seismic Survey, the Barclay Seismic Survey, um, some geochronology and stratigraphic work that was undertaken, and also uh, NDI Carrara 1 uh, geochemistry results. So the aim of exploring uh, for the future, which is a multi-year Australian federal government initiative, is to improve the desirability for industry investment uh, in, in Northern Australia particularly, but in frontier basins across Australia. Uh, this talk will focus on the main impacts from our work, um, which are focused around the South Nicholson uh, Basin region, and of course include the drilling of NDI Carrara 1. Now, just in case I'd missed people, um, we work collaboratively with the NTGS, uh, the Queensland Geological Survey, Oscope, and the MinEx CRC, and uh, all of them provide input into our work. So in terms of geology and keeping it simple, there are three major geological regions in this part of central northern Australia. The Mount Isa province, which is known as a, as a mining province in Queensland, the South Nicholson region, which is the, the blue blob on the slide there, and then the MacArthur Basin, which of course includes the Beetaloo Subbasin uh, in sort of more central NT. Now these are all Paleoproterozoic to Mesoproterozoic basins, and until we had undertaken this work, we didn't really understand how they related to each other. Um, just as an aside for people looking at the slides, things can be hard to find at GA. They're the web pages with all our outputs on them. So if you're looking for something, go there. So here we have, um, I'm going to talk about South Nicholson survey, and um, you can see here one example of the, of the seismic. Um, and there's the main thing. What have I got on the slide? So this was completed in 2017 and included five seismic lines in an orientation to best image the geological features. And you can see some of those examples in the gravity here. Oh, I don't know how to make it light up, but there you go in the gravity low. And um, you can see marked on the seismic there, the century mine on some older GA seismic. So this, under, this study was undertaken in tandem with several uh, regional geological studies, including surface geochemistry and petroleum and mineral systems geochemistry. And the result of all of this work was the discovery of the Carrara subbasin, which was quite exciting. So you can see here the Carrara subbasin in profile. Uh, this is on seismic line SN2, uh, which is a northwest southeast cross section of the basin. Um, and it, our team has interpreted this data and we uh, have brought in a lot of units from the surface. Uh, we've got the Georgina Basin at the top, which is pretty uh, evident when you're there at the top. But we've also been able to track in known geological units, including parts of the South Nicholson Basin. You have some of there above the yellow line and then parts of the Mount Isa Super Basin, which is the way the uh, nomenclature works when you're in the Isa Super Basin area um, of Mount Isa. The lower two units are units interpreted in the Mount Isa area, um, but none of those come to surface. So we're interpreting that from the known geological framework that exists in the Mount Isa area. And just to prove that we do like rocks, <laughs> this is a beautiful rock. Um, this is the Riversley Siltstone. Um, it's one of the uh, units that we interpret to be able to track it into the Carrara subbasin from the surface. So the second piece of information, uh, second set of work, I think, that um, I'd like to discuss is the Barclay Seismic Survey. So this Barclay uh, Seismic Survey, shown here in the purple, uh, was collected in 2019 to extend the South Nicholson uh, data across the Barclay Tablelands and up into the Beetaloo Subbasin. So the Barclay Seismic links with legacy GA 
seismic as well as the South Nicholson seismic and the newly acquired Camerwheel seismic. Um, and you can see here that it forms quite an extensive um, set of information across the area. And you can also see why we needed to use seismic here because it's all black soil plains and not a lot of rocks stick out of the surface. So it's been very insightful. There we go, that's better. So the key results of the Barclay Seismic Survey are the definition of three distinct informal domains based on the geological, structural and basin architectural elements. These are the Carrara Domain, the Brunette Downs Rift Corridor and the Beta Lou MacArthur Domain. Uh, and we'll just discuss these in more detail on the slides, but the Carrara Domain is the area over which the Carrara Subbasin exists. The Brunette Downs Rift Corridor is the highly structured part between the Carrara Domain and the Beetaloo MacArthur Domain, and they all have quite distinct uh, looks, feels, geology. Um, so the interpretation of the Barclay seismic reveals previously unknown Paleozoic to Mesoproterozoic basin successions, as well as Proterozoic half graben rifts, basement heterogeneity beneath the Barclay tablelands. Importantly, it provides a continuous seismic profile linking the highly prospective Beetaloo subbasin uh, to the northwest, sorry, in the northwest, to the newly discovered Carrara subbasin in the southeast. Interpretation of the Barclay Seismic Survey is tied to those of the South Nicholson Survey in the Carrara subbasin and the well-studied Beetaloo subbasin. And I think the important, there is many ways that the NT geology is described, um, and we've attempted to sort of have a go at working out where those commonalities are, but they, there are similarities in both sets of um, descriptions to the rulings at L framework, but also to the Jackson et al nomenclature and, and that framework. So um, that leads very nicely into the geochronology and stratigraphic correlations that were undertaken in the South Nicholson program. So as part of this program, the team collected 47 samples um, from various basement units in the Neoproterozoic um, and undertook a comprehensive uranium-led uh, shrimp zircon and xenotime geochronology program. This helped us to better understand the basin evolution, uh, the stratigraphy of the region and its relationship to the um, you know, the, the two next door neighbours, the Mount Isa province and the MacArthur Basin. So the results of this have led to a revision of the stratigraphy across the region. And one of the major findings is the reallocation of some units thought to be Mesoproterozoic, South Nicholson group, into the older, later Paleoproterozoic groups, which are either super basin in age. So the results have been, that the geochronological analysis confirms that the South Nicholson group is temporarily equivalent to the Roper group of the MacArthur Basin. That's important. That's where the prospective Beetaloo subbasin sits. The study also resulted in the revision of the Carrara Range group, which incorporates the Surprise Creek formation and the Drummond formation, representing a tectonostratigraphic package of around 1725. Some units from the Ben Mara region, previously assigned to the Mesoproterozoic South Nicholson group, have been reassigned into a revised, expanded Paleoproterozoic Ben Mara group in circa 1640. That's the river event for those um, in the Mount Isa nomenclature. So the increase, this increases uh, the geographic extent of the highly prospective late Paleoproterozoic stratigraphy, which is the revised Ben Mara group, and it extends it westwards beneath the Georgina Basin for an unknown distance. So this really increases the prospectivity for this area for MVT and SEDEC style mineral occurrences. Renaming of these stratigraphic units is underway um, and in collaboration with the NTGS. There is a, um, a new map sheet that's uh, currently in process as well as an AJES paper to describe all of the um, the changes and the science behind that geochronology. So moving on to the Carrara Subbasin. Yeah, uh, you will recall that we discovered this Carrara Subbasin back with uh, this um, South Nicholson seismic survey. And um, the Carrara Subbasin is described as a large concealed proterozoic depicenter. Um, and it is at least eight kilometers in depth 
uh, approximately 190 kilometers north south and as much as 120 kilometers wide. So during uh, the work in this area, there we go, there's a label, um, the MINEX CRC undertook the drilling of a deep stratigraphic uh, drill hole, NDI Carrara 1, and that was completed in December 2020. Uh, and that was in collaboration with GA and of the NTGS. This was drilled to test the stratigraphy to better understand the geology and resource potential of the Carrara Subbasin. Now, the Carrara Subbasin is located on the western flank of, sorry, the Carrara Subbasin. The Carrara, NDI Carrara 1 well is located on the western flank of the basin um, and is overlain by uh, the Cambrian Georgina sediments. Uh, you can see here a picture from the rig and also the location. I won't point of the um, of the well. So it was cited there just to get as much of the stratigraphy as we could, we hoped. Okay, so the drill hole intersected approximately 630 metres of Georgina Basin carbonates, and, and these were unconformably underlain by 1120 metres of Proterozoic sedimentary rocks. I'm just not sure where the animation here stops, so I won't go too far. Um, the geochronological results uh, indicate that the rocks from uh, 1,012 metres to 1,650 metres are equivalent to the Paleo to Mesoproterozoic Upper Lawn Hill Formation. Uh, the hole was fully cored from 284 metres to TD and cuttings were required to the surface. A full suite of wireline logs was uh, acquired by Weatherford, and these inclo uh, included all of the, you know, popular ones, uh, resisti resistivity imaging, cross-pole, diposonic, and spectral gamma ray. Oh. Excitingly, there were several hydrocarbon shows in NDI Carrara 1. Um, now, I'm just going to pull them all up. There we go. Uh, so viscous bitumen was spotted at 528 metres in a carbonate bug in the Georgina Basin, and then there were two further oil stone stains identified at around 760 and 765 metres. In addition to the oil stains, mud gas logging recorded a sustained release of gas with up to 2% methane concentrations, and analysis from the gas samples suggested that the gases are sourced from local thermally mature organic shales and siltstones. That's the uh, very high tech gas collection with a tube. Now, so bring these up. The organic geochemistry that was undertaken by our colleagues uh, indicated that the organic rich oil prone source rocks in the Cambrian section, um, that there were black shales at the top of the Proterozoic section which are um, potential for gas generation, um, and that the Proterozoic section is organic rich, but no remaining hydrocarbons uh, are present. And but it, let me re read that sentence. Uh, the Proterozoic section is organic rich, but has no remaining hydrocarbon potential. So it would represent a potential gas shale resource. Geochemical analysis of hydrocarbons shows um, have revealed that the occurrence of there are several petroleum systems in this well. I'm just going to briefly go through those. So the ge geochemical uh, results were put into the context of the Australian Petroleum Super Systems Framework, init uh, initially developed by Marita, who's here today. Hooray! Um, and this is a continental scale framework. Um, linking basins of similar age, structural history, depositional environment, and hydrocarbon potential. So the geochemical results in NDI Carrara 1 highlighted the presence of at least two petroleum systems. These are the oil stain in the Georgina Basin that belongs to the Cambrian Larapintine uh, 1 petroleum system, and the gas shows that were a little bit deeper belong to the Lawn Hill petroleum system. The Lawn uh, petroleum system is uh, newly defined by our colleagues at the NTGS. Um, so it's great that this system is being updated as we go along and find new things. So the Proterozoic oil stains that were at around 760 metres, their geochemistry is consistent with Proterozoic sources, but much more work is needed to understand the, um, which specific petroleum systems family they belong to. 
So all this work has happened sort of in the central and um, uh, the, the eastern and central parts of the NT, and um, it's been really excited. And now our team is looking at sort of expanding our understanding of that framework and how it fits into some things a little further in the west. So we are currently we are undertaking a Birundudu and Greater Macarthur uh, well study, uh, including geochemistry, uh, geomechanics, and petrophysics. Uh, we have some isotope work in that and uh, thin section petrology and geochronology. And here's a couple of crazy characters collecting the cores there um, in my colleagues. So uh, we hope to be able to compare this work, this new work to the work that we've done and really understand how they link together as well. Um, and anyone looking for any more information on our projects, um, please hop on the webpage and, and have a look. So I will now hand over to Steve Abbott, who will present his slides. Thanks, Steve. Excuse me. And now for something completely different. <laughs> So the work I'm presenting today uh, is being undertaken um, in the Offshore Energy Directorate here at um, Geoscience Australia, and it's part of a much larger pre-competitive study uh, that's uh, underway. Um, this, this material on gross depositional environments uh, uh, forms um, uh, a conference presentation that I delivered earlier this year at the Australian Exploration Geoscience Conference. Uh, and so uh, what I've done here today is to, um, uh, for our more general audience, is to um, in introduce the concept of gross depositional environments in basin analysis uh, and how it's applied to our pre-competitive studies. So uh, at this point, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, um, mostly from the uh, offshore energy team. Um, but uh, uh, we, we, our work was in collaboration with uh, uh, Schlumberger, a big um, multi-client international consulting and contracting company, and in particular, Oliver Shank, who worked up the petroleum systems model for this project. And we'd also like to acknowledge uh, the GA repository for uh, providing access to the core used in this study. Okay, so th this is my little introduction to gross depositional environments, uh, just to, to, to set the scene to the non-specialist audience. So, and it depicts uh, the cartoon of a number of depositional settings that you might expect to find around the edge of a uh, sedimentary basin. And uh, uh, th there's a number of uh, depositional settings, many of which will be familiar to you from everyday experience. It includes uh, fluvial or river systems, deltas, lakes, beaches and so on, uh, and sediments can also be deposited on the uh, shelf area and even into the uh, deep sea. So the general idea is that the uh, sediments are derived from weathering and erosion of a hinterland, uh, sand, gravel, mud. They're, those sediments are transported to the basin margin and distributed among these various depositional settings. And of course, over time, as the basin subsides, the sediments accumulate and uh, a basin fill can be comprised of several thousand metres of sediment, all made up of these various depositional settings. Now, um, we're going to be concentrating on um, deltaic and fluvial um, uh, environments in, in this talk. So I thought I'd just um, zoom in a little bit and have a look at a couple of those from the, uh, the modern uh, Australian continent. Uh, so, and at the same time, introduce, uh, introduce the concept of depositional environment, DE, and gross depositional environments, or GDE. So, at left is uh, uh, the Google image of the Burdekin Delta in North Queensland. That field of view is about 50 kilometres across, and there's the township of Air located in the middle there. And, and what we can see is the Burdekin River bringing its sediment load down to the coast, depositing it onto the delta and out into the ocean. And um, if you look at various parts of this uh, image, uh, you can see various depositional environments. And so, for example, uh, where the river uh, approaches the ocean, we can see a number of distributary channels. 
and some uh, delta mouth bars. So they're the modern active uh, environments, and there's a number of um, abandoned or older um, channels and bars that make up the lower delta plane of the Burdekin Delta. So those individual depositional environments are combined into, into uh, certain categories that we refer to as gross depositional environments. The other key one from the deltaic systems is um, the pro-delta uh, depositional environment, usually muddy, and that forms part of the so-called uh, sh shelf GDE. Now the, uh, uh, at right, we've got a, a, another Google image. The field of view is about 20 kilometres across this time, and it depicts uh, the River Murray um, on the border of South Australia and Victoria, just near Renmark. And so this is a fluvial uh, depositional setting, and it's uh, you can see the uh, modern River Murray channel meandering around. And in fact, most of the deposits that we can see, or most of the environments, relate to those uh, um, river meanders, so-called uh, river meander depositional environments. And of course, the whole meander belt uh, represents a floodplain, as we know from recent history in the media. Uh, and, and those are grouped together to form the fluvial plain GDE. So they're, they're key depositional environments and gross depositional environments uh, that we recognise in our study in the Otway Basin. And now, now I'll, uh, in the next slide, I'll bring that um, into uh, uh, from the modern environments back into the ancient uh, using this image from part of a basin fill from the Cretaceous in uh, Utah in the United States. And it represents a series of uh, layers, um, GDE, all stacked up to form part of the basin fill, which is now obviously exhumed and exposed on land. So the light coloured bands represent sandy, uh, sandy rocks and fluvial and um, deltaic gross depositional environments, and the intervening darker intervals are mudridge, and they include pro-delta mud environments. So we can see these GDEs uh, stacking up to form part of the basin fill. Now, in the next slide, we'll look at um, how, how this relates to our pre-competitive studies at GA and show the relationship between these gross depositional environments um, and various play elements in petroleum systems and what that means for prospectivity um, assessment of sedimentary basins and our pre-competitive work. So if you envisage um, the, the, the horizontal layers from that previous slide, uh, buckled or folded into a, uh, an anticline like this, um, we can see that the, uh, there are various uh, so-called play elements related to uh, this anticline configuration and the so-called play elements that it comprises. So uh, to begin with, we've got um, um, the oil and gas in this trap, and uh, it resides in the reservoir rock. It's uh, usually or typically a sandstone. Uh, it's porous and permeable. Now, uh, over the top of the uh, accumulation is a cap or seal rock, and it's uh, an imper impermeable rock type that prevents the hydrocarbons from further migrating within the sedimentary basin, allowing that accumulation of oil and gas to form. And then if not shown in this particular field of view, we require for this system a source rock, which is an organic rich uh, sedimentary rock uh, from which the uh, hydrocarbons are originally derived. So it turns out that these um, so-called play elements of this petroleum system, reservoir, seal, source rock, uh, all have physical and chemical properties that ultimately relate to their original environment of deposition as highlighted in this entry in the table below. So, so I've highlighted the, um, uh, the, the play elements and the corresponding GDEs that, that uh, might be associated with this kind of configuration in a petroleum system. But equally, um, we can apply, just as another little digression, uh, this same approach to where uh, carbon uh, capture and storage studies, uh, where uh, um, instead of hydrocarbons in the trap, we're looking to uh, add CO2. And in that case, the reservoir and seal play elements are key. And for groundwater studies, um, um, the, the same is true. Reservoir and seal are important, but in this context, they're referred to as aquifer and aquaclude. 
So there are any number of combinations and permutations of uh, GDE uh, that can uh, um, um, represent or, or, or perform, uh, uh, if you like, um, as these various play elements in these systems. So what we can do is to, uh, um, in the in the subsurface, as in the offshore basins of Australia, is to to study the, the petroleum well information and the uh, extensive seismic surveys to interpret the environments of deposition that we see, uh, formulate our GDE, and then map them across the basin to produce maps, which which ultimately tell us uh, the distribution of play elements um, and uh, whether or not there might be um, a petroleum system operating in the interval of interest. And so uh, this kind of work is an important part of our pre-competitive work uh, in the offshore energy team, but uh, also in the people looking at CO2 and groundwater at Geoscience Australia. So that's my, my little introduction. Um, and so we'll now launch back into the Otway Basin. Uh, here it is located offshore Victorian and South Australia. This is the rough outline of the basin that encroaches onshore in this region through here. And the, the Otway Basin was chosen as a, as a subject of our current work because uh, in, uh, in 2014 there was a, a, um, a report released by Geoscience Australia which summarised the offshore uh, frontier sedimentary basins around the Australian margin. And it was recognised in that work that the deep water part of the Otway Basin, the area beyond the modern continental shelf in this region through here, uh, uh, was, um, was very sparse in terms of its data coverage. It's very few um, uh, exploration drill holes and very little seismic information. So it's difficult to assess its prospectivity. And so to address this in, in 2020, um, Geoscience Australia, our team in the offshore directorate teamed up with Schlumberger, the, the, the large international multi-client company, to, to start a large pre-competitive um, study of the offshore Otway Bay Basin um, with a particular focus on the deep water part of the basin. Now, the particular interval in the Otway Basin that we're interested in is called the Sherbrooke Super Sequence. That's an interval of strata that's uh, late Cretaceous in age. And if you look at the inset uh, to the left here, um, you can see the uh, plate tectonic uh, configuration of Australia and Antarctica at that time. It's showing Australia beginning to separate from Antarctica, but you'll notice that in the position of the Otway Basin in this sector of the southern margin, that separation uh, had yet to occur. So that's the broadest plate tectonic kind of um, uh, context for the study. Now, this colourful map represents the thickness of the Sherbrooke super sequence. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the main uh, thicknesses of the super sequences are deposited in the Morham and Nelson subbasins, so that's represented by the blue, magenta, and greenish coloured tones. So these are the depot centres for the Sherbrooke de um, super sequence. And the, uh, as you go towards uh, uh, the, the basin margin, the set, the sequence is much thinner, shown in the orange and yellow colours. And uh, in the far outboard part of the basin, um, the sediments thin up against these large features that we refer to as outer margin highs. Now, <clears throat> this, this thickness map of the Sherbrooke sequence is the base map for our study effectively, provides the geological context. And what we did was we, um, ex excuse me, we examined uh, the seismic data that extends um, across the basin. And we uh, looked at the uh, over 30 uh, wells in terms of its uh, lithological information and downhole um, um, geophysical logs. And we integrated that information to produce uh, interpretations of gross depositional environment. And then we propagated those interpretations throughout the seismic grid uh, and throughout the basin. So um, going from the map view to the uh, cross-section view in seismic now, I'll show you a cross-section that runs through this part of the basin across the Morham sub-basin. So this is an, an interpreted uh, seismic seismic reflection um, uh, profile and the Sherbrooke super sequence is shown in the purple colour uh, and it shows the main 
thickness is developed in that Morham subbasin depot center. Now these uh, these curvy black lines are geological faults, and uh, they were active at the time that the Sherbrooke super sequence was being deposited. Um, and we can tell that because um, the, the thickness of the super sequence thickens into some of these faults. So the faults were active and moving as the sediments were being deposited. And now I have a quick look just to summarize the stratigraphic context within the basin. Uh, this is part of the stratigraphic chart for the Otway Basin, and this is the Sherbrooke interval again in purple. And this chart tells us that it was deposited during a period of basin extension, and I just referred to those active faults. Uh, this chart also summarises the broad depositional settings and cartoon form, mainly uh, this is derived mainly from the onshore part of the basin. It shows the various uh, lithostratigraphic units that make up the sediments. And importantly for us, um, it has a biostratigraphic scheme which allows us to uh, put an age on, this, on the uh, strata in the drill holes and to be able to recognise and map the Sherbrooke super sequence uh, uh, in, in wells and extend that mapping throughout the basin into the seismic. And the time period that we're dealing with is late Cretaceous, uh, specifically Campanian to Maastrichtian in age. So. That's uh, the broad introduction to the Sherbrooke super sequence as an interval of strata within the Otway Basin. And we'll move on and look at these um, data sets beginning with the core. So our colleague Chris Cubitt uh, studied um, the core from four of the exploration wells. Um, here's an example. Uh, so this is a photograph of the core from Voluta 1, uh, just showing the alternation of the uh, light coloured sandy layers and the darker coloured muddy layers. And he uh, examined these cores and described them carefully to produce um, this chart. And in particular, this uh, so-called graphic log of the strata represented in the core. It's been logged at centimetre scale. And this interval of core is about seven metres thick. And he was able to interpret the various depositional environments from examining the core and from the features that he saw to come up with um, uh, delta front environments, proximal and delta uh, depositional environments, which were rolled up into uh, a delta front GDE. So that's the sort of work that uh, uh, Chris did across those four wells and 18 sections of core. Uh, but uh, amongst the 30 plus wells that we looked at, uh, the core only made up a very tiny amount of the, the entire stratigraphy that was intersected. So uh, the idea then was to extrapolate the GDE interpretations uh, using the downhole Y line logs, in this case, um, the gamma ray log that's part of the seismic, uh, the, 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 the well exploration uh, data sets. So, so the gamma, gamma ray log has certain trends and motifs that were related back to their uh, GDE and Chris was uh, able to subdivide the wells into its depositional environments and its gross depositional environments and the main sorts of uh, um, uh, GDEs that he recognised were lower delta plane, delta front and shelf uh, along the lines that we discussed in the introduction. So there's an example of his analysis from from three of the wells of, of the 30 odd that were examined in the project. Now, then the idea was to see how those well interpretations related to the seismic reflection data that we have across the basin. So these are uh, examples of close-ups of some seismic sections. And uh, what we can do is to recognize so-called seismic facies, and we do that by looking at the continuity of the seismic reflections and their, uh, their brightness or amplitude, uh, the various geometries that we can recognize. And um, to cut a long story short, we can um, um, use the seismic facies to interpret gross depositional environments, especially where we've got control from the drill holes. And so we recognise a fluvial plain, um, a gross depositional environment, a coastal deltaic plain, and a shelf gross depositional environment. So in the case of the seismic, we had to roll up the GDE into what we're calling regional GDE because the uh, 
uh, because of the re essentially because of the regional scale, the basin scale that we're looking at compared to the centimetre scale uh, in the in the exploration wells. So they're the the three main R GDE that we recognise in seismic profiles, and then what we're able to do is look at a number of or numerous seismic profiles across the basin, uh, interpret them in terms of these um, regional GDEs, and I've colour coded them in this profile of the Sh of the Sherbrooke super sequence, which is flattened on the top of the super sequence. And so we've got the fluvial plain, the coastal plain deltaic, and the, the offshore shelf. Yes. Uh, regional GDE shaded in this profile. And of course, we're able to mark off the transitions between those regional GDEs on numerous seismic profiles just like this, and then construct lines and polygons to form our map. So in this uh, 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 second part of the talk, I guess, I'll step through how we compiled our map. So this is a base map. Uh, of the Upway Basin, and it shows an outline of the basin, uh, and in particular, um, the wells, the position of the wells that have been colour coded according to their regional GDE. And for good measure, I've included some previously published data from the onshore just to complete the map. So the well based GDE is plotted up there, and we can add some other features. We add uh, fo uh, faults. Um, because they're an important part of the story. As I mentioned, they were active during time, the time of deposition of the Sherbrooke super sequence, as were um, the folds that we've been able to um, uh, to map in there, the, uh, the red lines that some of you might be able to see. Then we can add in uh, some other bits and pieces that are there on the whole story, um, uh, particularly the, the polygons of the regional GDEs. So here they are, the, the yellow fluvial plain, the uh, the greeny coloured coastal and delta plain, and the offshore uh, shelf uh, regional GDE. We can uh, then add a few other bits and pieces, including uh, these blue lines, which you can see up through here. And there's a couple of examples in the inset here. And what they, they show are the, uh, the edges of uh, uh, deltas that we can see in the seismic data. And they indicate that the sediments were uh, being transported into the basin and the and, and the sediments were building towards uh, the southwest in this part of the basin. And when you fo follow the, uh, the, the RGDE belts around the basin, this north-south trend indicates that the deltas were building from east to west. For good measure, I've also included some other features of the Sherbrooke super sequence, especially these uh, these polygons in here, which represent uh, what we refer to as mass transport deposits. They're giant slumps, effectively mass wasting deposits. The largest of these is about 60 or 70 kilometres wide. And we can add other features, including the outer margin highs that I referred to earlier in the in the introduction and any other information that uh, comes to bear on the GDE story. And finally, we can add some extra annotation and that completes the compilation of the, the GDE map for the Otway super sequence. So in, in the conclusions, we can make a few point about points about what all that means for our work. And so this, this new map is a, is, a, is a new estimate of, of GDE distribution for the Sherbrooke super sequence across the entire Otway Basin, and in particular, the poorly understood deep water part of the basin. Um, and as, as I referred to previously, the distribution of these GDE uh, is a proxy um, in many ways for the distribution uh, of play elements in petroleum systems. So it turns out that this marine offshore uh, shelf mud GDE uh, is a poten potentially good source rock um, in, in the Sherbrooke se super sequence. And, um, and pre pre preliminary uh, uh, new petroleum systems modelling indicates that this source rock may well have been productive uh, within the Sherbrooke super sequence to generate hydrocarbons where it's deeply buried. So when you're looking at those various play element considerations in combination with the her thermal history of the basin. We need that heat to generate the hydrocarbons. You can you can hone in or 
assess the prospectivity of the basin. And so these two stars just represent where those petroleum uh, play elements and, and the thermal history might be favourable uh, for the development of uh, hydrocarbon accumulations. So of course, um, this, 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 these maps can be used as input into petroleum systems modelling. So we can uh, test our ideas and uh, see if it influences our assessment of uh, prospectivity of the basin. And early indications are uh, that uh, our work in the Sherbrooke super sequence will enhance the, uh, the prospectivity of hydrocarbons in the deep water part of the Otway Basin. And uh, thank you very much for listening.